Father God, we thank you tonight just for the privilege and opportunity to come once again to study the Word of God. We thank you that we continue to look at um, the, the, the series Enduring until the end. We just thank you for just showing us what faith truly looks like and how we as believers can truly live by faith. And so we thank you for this, and we praise you and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we left off in 1 Peter chapter 3. We stopped at... Uh, from verses, we read verses 8 through 12, and so uh, we're going to just read that again, just kind of refresh it, and we're going to start at verse 13, and we're just going to continue to move forward in this, uh, but First Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, he says, finally, everyone must live in harmony, be sympathetic, love each other, have compassion, and be humble, so this is what he's, he tells us as believers that we're to do. He says, verse 9, don't pay people back with, the, with evil for the evil they do to you, or ridicule those who ridicule you. Instead, bless them because you are called to inherit a blessing. People who want to live a full life and enjoy good days must keep their tongues from saying evil things and their lips from speaking deceitful things. They must turn away from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. The Lord's eyes are on those who do what he approves. His ears hear their prayer. The Lord confronts those who do evil. So that's what we left off last week. And so let's start at verse 13. And I'm not going to go back over those because I'll get stuck again and we won't get anywhere. <laughs> but verse 13 uh, says this. It says, who will harm you if you are devoted to doing what is good? Who will harm you? That's the question he asks. Most of us would love to think, well, if I do what's good, nobody will harm me. Well, no, they will. <laughs> I mean, and that's the reality. Uh, maybe not every time, but, but with what is set before today in this generation, people will probably want to harm you for doing good. Uh, again, what is good? Good is seen in our obedience to God. Uh, following his instruction, following his word, uh, listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and being committed to that and not deviating from the right or to the left, but just sticking with what God tells us to do. That's good. And what we do for God, this is, may not be seen as good by the world, but we have to understand, it, as long as it is seen as good before God, that's, that's really the only record that matters. Amen? Because it is His throne that is the throne of Christ that we must stand before and give an account for our works. You know, we know our salvation is settled because we place our faith in Jesus Christ. But where, where rewards are concerned as believers, uh, He's going to look at how the good we did in the earth. And that good is seen in how well did we truly live a life of obedience to him. All right? So he says, uh, he asked the question, who will harm you if you, if you are devoted to doing what is good? Now, I know he said where your commitment is, you said should be, you should be devoted to doing good. And now, devotion is a very important thing. It's almost like a, just a, a steady commitment that, that you don't deviate from, meaning you don't base obeying God on the culture. Because many times people change their good before God based on what the culture is saying. Or what about when they, if they change the laws that contradict what's good before God? So you got to be devoted to good regardless of what the culture says, regardless of what the, the laws of the land say that may contradict that which God commands. Uh, it doesn't matter how much time has passed. They may say it's outdated. It doesn't matter. We are committed to what's good, or we are committed to that which God has said. And that's what we'll follow through with, and that's what we'll stand on. Amen? Amen. Then we said in verse 14, But even if you suffer for doing what God approves, you are blessed. So you have to look at it like that. When people uh, curse you for doing what's good, people stand against you. The mob gathers against you because you stand on the truth of God's word. When they call you closed-minded because you're not willing to get with their prayer program or their narrative because, you know, you're, you're in disagreement with it uh, and they persecute you for that, He's a, he calls you blessed. So, so what we have to understand that it is a blessing to suffer with Jesus. And we have to really look at it. And we have to, we have to look at uh, the fact that when we suffer with him, it may not look like it's benefiting us in this life. But we have to remember that we're living for the life to come and not just this life. This life is very temporary, but the life we have with Jesus is for eternity. Amen. So that means if you rule with him up there, guess what? You'll never be taken out of that position of ruling. Amen. Forever. 
<laughs> and forever is a long time. And isn't that, that's, that alone is great news. So, so no matter what I go through down here, it doesn't matter because ultimately when I stand before Jesus and he and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's, that's, that's the one, that's the, really the only proof you really need is his at the end of the day. But look what he says, he, said, he says, don't be afraid of those who want to harm you. So there will be some who want to harm you. But he says, don't be afraid. <clears throat> well, then Jesus commanded this, I fear not. I mean, he tells him, don't, don't, don't allow your heart to be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Come on, amen. He, so Jesus tells us or commands us that, no, don't let your heart be afraid. Why? Because what, now, what makes people afraid? Trouble. <laughs> trouble would do that. Get in trouble with Jesus. Makes you want to shy away. Makes you want to go in the closet and not talk about it no more. You know, makes you want to uh, uh, try to be kind of neutral so you don't really, quote, under the guise of, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, we do not, listen, we do not live this life with the perspective of whether or not we offend people. We live the life with the intent simply to please Jesus. And you, let me say this, you cannot please Jesus and not expect to offend this world. Because this world is not our home. They, they operate the very, very opposite of how we operate. So don't be surprised when people, you get, when people are offended by you because you stand for principles. You stand on the, on the word of God. All right, he said, don't be afraid of those who want to harm you. The way he said, as he says, don't get upset, because don't we get upset when we feel like people are mistreating us? Mm -hmm. And we, in our heart, know they're mistreating us. But he tells us, I say this to you as I say it to myself, don't, don't get upset. Because <coughs> it's easy to do, isn't it? Yeah. It's so easy to get that, that, that emotion of injustice on your part makes you want to just get upset. But, but just remember, he said, well, Pat, what's going to keep me from getting upset? To remember... That, there, that for everything you go through, there is a, 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 a balance of reward on the other side. And you have to remember that. That, that every time someone gets upset at you or, or mad at you or persecutes you because you stand with Jesus, just understand that's just increasing your reward when you're with him. And so, you know, so it's, you know, don't get upset because you say, well, you know, it's past kind of difficult when my emotions are running and you know, well, you have to, you have to, remember how you, you have to guard your thoughts. You have to reel those emotions in, praise God. You know, you can't allow your emotions to dictate how you respond. That's why I tell you, you have to rehearse stuff. And again, it's, it's difficult for me, like anybody else, because there are some emotions that are very strong, as, especially when it deals with injustice, you know, or someone lying. You know, you know, I, you know when people lie on you, it just, man, I don't know about you, but it just gets in my craw. <laughs> it does. You know, when, when you know they're lying, and not only when people lie on you, but when people that they tell it to believe the lie and start treating you differently. And I, so I say this to, you, to myself as much as I say it to you, man, that Donald, don't get upset. Because they're just adding to your reward. Because the truth of the matter, it, it's going to all come out in the wash anyway. There, when we stand before the Lord, there's nothing going to be hidden. There's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. Everything will be revealed. Motives and intents, everything go be revealed. Alright, he says, so, he says, don't get upset. Look what he says in verse 15. So rather than getting upset, look what he says, but dedicate your lives to Christ as Lord. But dedicate your lives to Christ as Lord. He didn't say just to Christ. He said, dedicate yourself to Christ as Lord. So that's different. Because people say, I'm dedicated to Christ, dedicated to Christ. But, you know, you can be dead in Christ as long as nothing really bad is happening. It's when those bad things happen to you because you're dead in Christ that, you, that will cause you to let go of his lordship of your life and thus you'll respond the way you want to rather than the way your Lord wants you to respond. So, he's, so that's very key. But dedicate your lives to Christ as Lord. Now what is Lord? The word Lord means supreme authority. What does supreme authority mean? It means one having the right to tell you how to think. He has the right to tell you how to talk. He has the right to tell you how to behave. So he, Jesus might be Christ your Savior, but, but are you going to keep in a position when he, he's going to be Christ your Lord? Always allowed to, to dictate your thoughts, your words, and your behaviors. And these are real questions that we really need to ponder. Because I'm telling you, it's just coming down to that, where, where people don't like the truth. 
You know, even Christian <laughs> don't like that truth. So he's like, that, that ain't the word. And they still get offended at you. Well, especially if you say something about their denomination, that their denomination is doing that is totally contrary to the word. You might want to get in church right then, boy, you know. Because people, people love, I said people love their religion. And sometimes their religion is their Lord. So, so we got to make sure that, that no matter what we go through, we don't get upset, we don't become afraid, and, he said, and we dedicate our lives to Christ as Lord. Which means before you have an emotional response to the persecution, you got to get with your Lord and say, how, how should I respond to this? I know how my flesh want to respond to this, but how do you want me to respond to this? And your, the, the response Jesus might have you to give, by all intents, may appear, even at times when you're in the heat of the emotion, may make you feel like, well, I'm just being weak, or I'm just being a doormat. Anybody else feel like that? You want me to do what, Jesus? They just lied on me. You want me to do cook what for them? Cook their favorite food. Are you serious, Jesus? But you do, but then, then here comes the choice. Is Christ going to be allowed to be my Lord? So then apart from what I feel, I have to dedicate myself to do what Jesus says. And then put a, put a faith smile on when you do it. Mm -hmm. Don't feel it, but you just do it by faith. So what's faith? Pleasing him, obeying him. Amen. The way he says, the way he says in the next part of this verse, he says, always be ready to defend your confidence in God when anyone asks you to explain it. Now, now listen to me. When people <laughs> give us an opportunity to to and that word defend is 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 an is a is an is a is a defensive weapon, isn't it? To defend. And so there are going to be times when people are going to say something, and you're going to have an opportunity to defend what you believe. He said, but you should always, always be ready to defend your confidence in God. Why, why are you going to church? Why are you giving to church? You know, that church don't need your money. They got big. It ain't, about, it ain't about that. It's about me and the Lord. This is a, that's why I tell you about your offering. It's a personal thing between you and the Lord. Go, oh, amen. God, God, you know, it, it, it's well, you know, if you turn it into something else, then what it does become religion. Mm. If I took, and this is what we're talking about a long time ago, they said, if you turn this into, into, into this whole concept that you better do this out of fear, or, you know, something bad can happen to you, he said, don't, he said, they'll never operate by faith. Mm. He said, it has to be a personal relationship, it has to be about a personal relationship with me. If, if, if your personal relationship with God isn't moving you to honor him, uh, fear is not a healthy response because as soon as you stop feeling afraid, you stop anyway. But if faith isn't attached to it, it doesn't please God anyway. Because then Bible says anything that's not a faith is sin. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why I never push you in terms of how you give to God or what you get. I, that's why I ain't going back and checking your records. I, you know, that's when you and the Lord, you and the Lord work it out. Amen. Because, because if, I, if I did that, then I would turn it into a law. You're not relationship. I mean, you know, you want to cook for somebody because you're scared they're going to hit you across the head if you don't? <laughs> or we, do you want to cook for somebody because, you know, you know, they love you and you love them? You see what I'm saying? What's the motivation? The motivation, you know, I want to cook for somebody just because I love them. And I'm, I'm scared they might shoot me if I don't. <laughs> you know? Amen. And we don't want to give God out of fear that they fear that he might do something to us or something bad and living in fear that something bad is going to happen to us. Oh, my God, if I don't give to God. You know, listen, it, it, people say, well, if, if you don't, you know, they're not going to give. Well, if you teach them how to love God, they will give. And, in fact, they'll give more because they, the more they love him, the more they'll give to him. You just have to teach it to them. Amen. If you don't teach, then come what? You know, my people perish because of a lack of knowledge and a lack of revealed will in the word of God. Why? They don't know what God says, so if we don't teach it to you, you won't know. And have you noticed that when you get taught things you didn't know, how it changes your life for the better? Mm -hmm. You know, it just changes. So, so our responsibility as pastors and teachers is to teach you, listen, teach you the truth. Beyond the, the, the emotional excitement of he got up early Sunday morning, ain't he all right? Or just telling you, God go bless you, River, he loves you, he go bless you, if you give <laughs> real big, right? See, we get that, didn't we? We got a lot of that to, to motivate people to give. 
but we never taught them about relationship. And so t people started drudging giving because we turned it into law. And everything we do is supposed to be motivated by love. Because faith worked by love. All right, so Luke says, he, he says, always be ready to defend your confidence in God when anyone asks you to explain it. So always be ready to explain why you believe what you believe. Don't shy away from that. Don't be afraid. You know, I'm on the job. Well, you know what? And so don't let, the, don't let the job become your Lord. If you have an opportunity to share your faith with somebody because they ask, do ask. Like I said, I don't mind getting two stars because you, don't, you ask me a question, I answer your question. My, question. my answer offends you. I'm cool with that. Give me those two stars. I take them proudly, praise God. Amen. <laughs> I might be a two-star to you, but I'm a five-star to Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. But look what he says here. Right? He says, however, now look what he says about how to convey or defend your confidence in God. He says, however, make your defense with gentleness and respect. Come on, how many times have you seen people beat people over the body? Whack, 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 you're going to hell. Whack, 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 you're going to hell. Whack. Well, they ain't going to get nobody saying. They will run from you. They would think you're just a mean, hateful person. But then we say, he tells us, he says, make your defense with gentleness and respect. In other words, don't, 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 don't open a conversation with somebody who's in a religious circle, don't, don't stuff that's just religious. Don't just jump them and tell them they're wrong. Just show them in the Word. Explain it to them from, from the Word. And let the Word speak for itself. Because guess what? Because God watches over His Word to perform it. So, so if, you know, just give them the word. Have you know when you just give people the word in gentleness, they have a, they, they're more receptive to it? They're, they might at least listen to you. That's getting a little different now because people know a little more aggressive about, the, about their sin because the intensity of sin is increasing. But, but typically what I found over the years is that when I'm, when I'm respectful to people and I'm gentle with it and I'm not just trying to bash it down their throat, they're more, way more receptive. Amen? So, so you know... Um, so, 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 so even, in, 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 and not only so, when you're praying about sharing, the, sharing, sharing uh, with people the confidence you have in God, also pray about, Lord, help me be gentle and respectful too. Because the Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. You know, not he that wins spirit, the spirit belongs to the Lord. But the soul is the, the, the mind. So you want to persuade a person's way of thinking. You can't just bash them. you gotta, you got to persuade them. I mean, when you look throughout the Bible how men persuaded God, when you look at, at Moses and, and Abraham, how they persuaded God, they were always respectful and gentle with God. They said, now, God, you just wrong. You just wrong. You shouldn't go. How you going to go down to Sunday street? You wrong, God. You should. None of them respect, responded to God that way. When the angel came to Abraham and said, we're going to go down and destroy Sodom. He said, hey, if you go back and read it, Abraham was very respectful. Excuse me, let me ask a question. Would you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? He said, he said so they listened to him. He said, if you find 10, 10 in the city where you spread the city, he was very, now mind you, before he even got to that, he fed them. <laughs> I mean, remember, he served them. Many times we want to tell people about our confidence in God, but we don't want to serve them. We just want to hammer them with the Bible. Whack, 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 whack. Ask them if they need something to pray for. Ask them if there's anything in their life you can pray for. Anything you, man, what's going on? Anything you need me to pray for? That opens them up because it shows that you care. But if you just whack people, I mean, think about how, how well did you change when you was in a religion that just bashed you over and made you feel condemned about everything? It didn't change very much. Well, you put on airs for them for a while, but eventually that got old and you left. Well, I know I did. I don't know what y'all did, but I did. Because I didn't like that. God, I didn't feel like I was being genuine. I feel like I was just performing. Now look at verse 16. Keep your conscience clear. See, if your conscience don't condemn you, this is another thing that happens with people. If, if, we're, if we're not even living the word, but we're trying to tell somebody about the word, and we know we're not living it, our conscience will condemn us, and we will stutter and struggle in sharing the word with them. He said, but keep your conscience clear. Well, how do I keep my conscience clear? One, if I haven't done everything, I, still, I, need, to live in a, I, I need to be able to repent and confess, my, confess and repent of my sins. I need to, before these opportunities come, because as soon as you confess it, 
and re, and confess, if you confess it, he wipes it off the map. So your con there's nothing for your conscience to be condemned about because you've already dealt with it. If you truly receive the forgiveness that comes from God, when you say, Lord, forgive me, I said, nah, man, I ain't been doing what I should do, forgive me. Right? So he says, uh, keep your conscience clear. Meaning deal with, deal with the stuff that, the stuff that are out of order. Uh, deal with them in your life before these opportunities come up. Because when you're feeling guilty about how you're living, it's very difficult to share Jesus with people. <laughs> that true? Give them my found that. It's difficult. You're not doing the right thing. But look what he says. He uh, says, so verse 16, keep your conscience clear. Then those who treat the good Christian life you live with contempt will feel ashamed that they have ridiculed you. So when see, here's the thing. When your conscience is clear, you live better. Just thing you do. When your conscience is clear, you're not you, you, you just where come, where your relationship with God is concerned, you just live better. When your conscience is clear, and when you do miss it, if you if you're quick to repent of it and get back up and keep moving, uh, it doesn't have time to take foothold into your heart. Mm. That's why you need to you know re confess quickly. Something you might have to confess in the middle of it. <laughs> I'm serious. It, and keep it moving. And then great asking for grace to help you to overcome and show you what you need to do. But in the process of, of, of going through that, it still keeps you in a position where you're not constantly being condemned. All right? And then to just straight up living right just keeps your conscience from being good. So just as much as we can, live right before God. Amen. And, and again, we all have areas in our life that we work on, that we know that are struggle more so than other areas. Uh, but we still have victory all of, over all those areas because we in Jesus. We just have to kind of get it to a point in our mind that we are truly victorious. Amen? All right, listen, he's a, verse 17 says this, After all, if it is God's will, it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing wrong. Amen? So if you go suffer, suffer for doing the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Amen? Any questions? Comments? Okay. Verse 18. That this is true because Christ suffered for our sins once. He was an innocent person, but he suffered for guilty people so that he could bring you to God. His body was put to death, but he was brought back to life through his spirit. So notice that. He was brought back to life through his spirit. So, so... So, so again, we go back to this whole concept that uh, uh, that Christ is our example for enduring faith. You know, He's our example of how we need to handle the things in life. You know, you know how you handle Christians and how you handle the world. Um, you're going to need the wisdom of God to do that. You're going to need the Spirit of God to lead you on how to deal with people, uh, especially today. Uh, you want to be you want to be as harmless as a dove as much as you possibly can. You know, in terms of of of, of, of being non-threatening to people. Because when people sense a threat, the first thing they do is put up walls. I, and, I, and I do that even as, just as a, a Christian. If, I, if a Christian approaches me in a very aggressive way, if, I, I'm not even thinking about what you're about to say. I'm already putting them the wall because I don't know what's going to come out of you. So, so you know, and, I, and I've had that happen at times when people were, were very aggressive. Uh, about what they believe, and, and, and almost forceful, like they're going to make you believe. Some people, this is what I find about some, some people just loud. And, 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 and what I found is that sometimes people are loud because loud is how they intimidate. I'm, I, you know, I, I've known men of God who are loud to intimidate. Because, you, you know, when people are loud, you kind of, you know, back down. You know, and... Um, so, you know, so we have to be, be very wise about that, you know. Uh, you don't want to be a point, as, as, as a Christian, you don't want to be unapproachable. Because you're so loud, you know. You, you, know, you, you know, hey, Jesus! You know, you, you, know, you can't go to work doing that. <laughs> you know, now be harmless as dove, but wise as serpents. You know, you never shy away from opportunities to share Jesus. And you should always live in an attitude of prayer, saying, Lord, you know, hey, open up a door. So I can share Jesus with somebody in some way. And you gotta be you gotta be sensitive to how he wants you to share him with people. Sometimes the way you share him with people is through your serving them. Like for instance, one guy I used to work for, I was working for this guy one time, and he hired this guy, this guy uh, had, had a drinking problem. You know, he really did. Uh, you know, can't remember his name, can't remember his name. 
And, uh, you know, uh, but the Lord impressed upon my heart to invite him over for dinner. And uh, at the time, we was living like a one little bedroom apartment, you know, and, uh, but we used to crowd that apartment with so many people, man. We used to have like 15 people in my little one little bedroom. I feed everybody. I fed, I think I fed everybody, man. Just love, I, and I love that, and that season of my life. But I, I, would, I invite him. I said, man, you know, hey, my wife, I would love for you to come, you know, come and have dinner with us, you know. He's like, oh, okay, okay, you know. I said, well, just let me know, man, when you can come, you know, I'll, you know, I'll come and get you, you know, and come down. He's like, oh, okay, okay. So some time passed by, and uh, he never got, he never said it. And I mean, we're working together, you know. And he never said anything about it. And, and so I approached him again. I said, bro, I said, you know, I said, hey, I said, man, I just want, you know, just want you to know, man, the invitation to come to dinner is still open. And he looked at me really, white guy too, he looked at me really strange, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm really serious. He said, we would love to have you to come, have you to, come to dinner. I said, you know, just, you know, if you want to go, come, let me know, I'll come get you, and, you know, and whatnot. You know, okay. So I said, well, so we found out, I just made a date. I said, we're going to make this date, you know, we made the date. And he came over, and that day we had a lot of friends over that day. And, and uh, you know, we just had, a, just had a lot of fun, wasn't pressing Jesus on them, and just, just being who we were, you know. And uh, one of my friends that came uh, ended up sharing Jesus with him. And uh, he ended up giving his life to the Lord. Uh, I got him there and he got him saved. But, but so when it was time to go, I was walking him out to, uh, to his car. And he said to me, he said, you know, he said, he said, I've been in a lot of places. He said, but I've never experienced love like that before. I said, really? I said, wow. You know, so I'm just saying, sometimes, the way you minister to people isn't first by thumping them over the head with the Bible. Sometimes you got to feed them <laughs> and then minister to them. But however the Lord tells you to do it, you, just, you always need to be open and don't get so locked into this, quote, one way of doing it. Uh, the, the Spirit of God is very creative in how to minister to people. Uh, and if we're open and, and sensitive to Him, uh, we'll always be ready to hear what He tells us to do and just roll with it. And uh, it, it, I'm telling you, uh, this is this is really where you you develop enduring faith. When your when your thoughts and your 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 life is set aside to serve people, looking for opportunities to share Jesus with people, looking for opportunities to, to speak into their lives, and to be sensitive to people. You know, because you know, here's the thing: you have to remember, people. A lot of people out here hurting. They don't admit it. They cover it up with stuff. You know. And they're hurting. And if you just if you come at them as a Bible thumper and screaming Jesus at them, and and, and, and you know uh, all it's going to do is it is is activate the pain that they already feel, and they're going to shut down on you. Sometimes the, sometimes you got to break out the salve, you know, Amen. Like a good hot meal, you know, <laughs> feed them real good, love them, hug them, you know, and just and just be friends with them before you start cramming Jesus, Jesus down their throat. Because here's what I also found. That the more you love on people, the more open they, they are to say, what makes you so different? And I've had a lot of people ask me, thanks a lot, but I have a few people ask me that, you know, what made you so, why you so, why you do this? I've had people, why you do this for me? I said, because the Lord loves you and he just wants me to. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Today that just happened to me, I was at the gas station. <clears throat> I was getting gas and there was this gentleman there and he said, hey man, you know, you have two dollars, you really need gas or whatever. And I had no cash on me, so I'm sorry, I don't have no cash. He said, okay. He said, no problem. Thank you anyway. And then I'm putting in my gas and then something, and then he was still walking around. I've seen people telling him, no, no, no. And then I just said to him, okay, so you need gas? And, you know, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'll go inside and I'll, you know, because I was thinking like, I don't know if it's just giving yeah, me the money they're going to use for something else. He said, oh, thank you so much or whatever. I really appreciate that. So I went in there and I got him some gas and I came back out and he was with three other people was in the car, so it was four all together, mm. like two couples it looks like. Uh. And so I, <laughs> you know, it, it amazes me, I was telling Larry, when I think back, I didn't have this boldness years ago. Mm. And I just went up to the car and I said, I just want to tell all you all that Jesus loves you guys and just give your life to him. Well, mm. And then as soon as I said that, he said, oh, thank you so much. He said, can you pray for this lady over here? Some lady, I guess he knew, her mm. name is Tammy. Uh. And she had the one of those things that you put up your nose when you carrying a tank. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I said, I said, sure. You know, and he goes, oh, she has emphysema or whatever. Oh, and I said, well, okay. what's your name? And right there in the parking lot, this lady, me, this guy that I gave the gas to, and I guess the girl that was with me, was, we all right there in the parking lot took hands, and I just prayed for this lady, you know? And they were just, like, so grateful. They were like, thank you so much. I mean, the girl was... 
throwing me kisses. Thank you for the gasoline. We really appreciate it. Blah, blah, blah. So. There you go. I mean, again. I so didn't expect that's how gas. bad. Yeah, who, thought, who knew gas would have led to all that? But see, isn't it amazing that people are open up when you first show them some, some kindness and gentleness? You know, and then when you offer to pray for them, they, they, they all for it because you've shown. See, you know, when you try to just Bible thump people, man, you know, they shut down on you because it, that really doesn't show that you have an interest in them, but it shows more so that you just want to thump your religion onto them. And, and people shut down when you do that. But I've always found that I've, I've always had to get involved with people first before I ever start actually ministering Jesus to them. And sometimes I, well, let me say that I had to minister Jesus to them first by how I was willing to serve them. And it is through that service that opened the door for questions about why do I do that and no and, and what I'm not. just thankful that God gives me the boldness. I mean, mm -hmm. no embarrassment, no moment. I'm like, sure, I'm just right there. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago or whatever, I probably would have been looking around, who's looking at nothing. I was just like, automatically. See, isn't it good like that? Unsuspected. Open up. And so that's why you can't all you can't really rehearse how you rehearse in a sense the how you're gonna handle ministering to somebody. That's why you just need to be open to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because because honestly it happens in so many different ways that you're you're not even looking for them. Mm -hmm. But if you're always prepared in the fact that you're submitted to the Spirit of God and you're open and you're letting him know I'm open to minister to people, whoever you want me to, and, you know, he'll use you at, at the most unopportune, unexpected times when you least expect it. It really will. Now, I gave you some here some scriptures on faith, and I want to just read through these tonight. I want to probably just close on these because of, again, I just want to help us understand the, the necessity of faith. Because we, we're dealing with this topic of, uh, but the, 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 the series has been called Enduring Unto the End, but we have been kind of dealing with the actions of enduring faith. That faith really does look a certain way. And that when people say they have faith, well, you know, there should be some attributes to this faith you say you have. And, uh, and so I do, these scriptures kind of talk about the importance of faith. And it says, and Romans 1 verse 17 says this, It says, God's approval is revealed in this good news. This approval begins and ends with faith. As scripture says, the person who has God's approval will live by faith. Now why do, why do we have God's approval? Because we do what he says. That's why we have his approval. Because we do what he asks us to do. Now he loves us and we are saved because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's really the good news. The good news of Jesus. That because we receive Jesus Christ we are saved. But he tells us that if we do have God's approval. This approval will, should cause us to live by faith in what he said. Because if his word were good enough to save us. Then his word is good enough to keep us. Amen. And if it's good enough to keep us. Then it's good enough to guide us. Amen. And so we need to. So, what do we say? Faith begins where the will of God is known. The will of God is the word of God, not just the written word, but also the word he speaks to your heart. Uh, and so if, if faith is going to come, you got to first hear him. If you don't hear him, faith can't come. Then all you have without hearing him is wishful thinking. Okay, God wants you to live by wishful thinking. God wants you to hear him, be it him speaking to you by his spirit or him speaking to you through the word. But you need to hear God. In some form of fashion. Most of the time it's going to be through the word. Or he'll, even when the spirit of God speaks, he'll speak the word to you. Um, so, so, but he says, but you know, because we have God's approval as those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, if we have faith to believe in Jesus, then we should have faith for, to, to let Jesus guide us the rest of our lives. I mean, come on, if he, was, if he was great enough to save us, then he's great enough to lead us and to guide us. Amen. Uh, so you have to, okay. Galatians chapter, 3, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 says this. It says, no one received God's approval by obeying the laws, the law's standards, since the person who has God's approval will live by faith. So people think about the, the rich young ruler had the law. He had rules and regulations. This is what religion offers us, rules and regulations. But when the, the rules and regulations meant the manifestation of love, which was Christ, then what he showed was he was more committed to his rules and regulations than he was to, to love. Because the Bible said Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, one thing you lack. But what, what was the one thing he lacked? He lacked love. And without love, and we're talking about agape love, not the emotional feeling, agape love, the love that comes from God. Without agape love, the keeping of the law is of no value to us. It doesn't do anything for us. 
Because it's only what we do in the love of God that truly activates faith. Because if we love God, then we will listen to what he has to say and we'll do what he says. So why? Because faith worketh by love. So and he's talking about agape love, not emotions and feelings because you get goosebumps. He's talking about agape love, which is obedience to God. All right, look at Hebrews uh, 10, verse 38. The person who has God's approval will live by faith. But if he turns back, I will not be pleased with it. Now, who's, who, who has God's approval? Those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. So here's the thing. You can have God's approval and yet still choose not to live by faith in his word. A person can truly be saved and still be stuck in religion. Because that's all they've ever known. It don't mean you're not saved. You just don't know any better. You haven't been taught anything. <laughs> you know, so, so, so we, we want more than just being saved. We want more than just believing in Jesus. But we really want to live a life of faith whereby our lives please him. Amen? All right. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And we'll read through. Uh, we go through these verse. It says, uh, no one can please God without faith. That sums it up right there. <laughs> no one. No one. <laughs> That's nobody can please God without faith. Now, what's faith? Faith is seen in our obedience to do what he says, not what people say you, they think you should do. See, religion tells you what people think you should do. But, but really, faith is, it begins where God has spoken and revealed to you, uh, and what he has spoken and revealed to you is what you apply to your life. Uh, again, 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 it's also the written word of God. You know, it's also the written word. But here's the thing. You, you got to write to divide the word. And the only way you and I can write to divide the word is we need the Holy Spirit who, who will lead us into what? All truth. So, so we got to have the Holy Spirit. So the written word without, without the spirit of truth leading us will always mislead us and we'll say and have doubts about it because we're trying to understand it out of human intellect. And I see people do it all the time. Why did they dismiss things? Because they're trying to understand it in human intellect and they've never learned how to develop an intimate relationship uh, with Jesus by the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can sit down with them and explain the Word of God to them. They don't give him that. They, they rely solely on their intellect. And their intellect really will, will cause them to doubt the Word. So he said, but no one can please God without faith. Whoever goes to God, this is, whoever goes to God must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, what's going to happen when you seek God? Okay, let me just ask you, ask, ask you a person, whenever you saw God, what happened? I found it. You found it. How, how did you know you found it? He spoke. There you go. He spoke to me. The, the, the indication, okay, when he spoke, did it contradict the Bible? No. Did it, did it highlight the Bible? I think I was being stunned. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so a lot of times people hear stuff, but it's not really the spirit of God. That's why the Bible says, believe not every spirit. So some people say they heard God. Like, that ain't God. You heard. Because God don't speak contrary to his written word. And then it's, well, you know, men wrote the Bible. Well, yeah. But it's, it's, now, here's what's amazing to me. People say, well, men wrote the Bible. So we can't, we have to disbelieve that. But then I, 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 the same people will believe some science report. <laughs> that men did, that men wrote, and will believe that before they'll believe this. Now, how is it they can believe the science, but they can't believe the word? Why? Here's why. Because typically when you're dealing with science, if, if a person has have a, a narrative that they're looking for, the science, go, you will find some science that proves it. Because here's what I found. This very same people that say they found this science to prove something. I said, there's a whole other science over here that disproves it, that disproves that science. Why do you choose to believe this one side of science, but then you don't look at the other side that says, not all that that science is saying is not true? Why do you only look at one? Because one fits your narrative. One fits what you want to believe. It supports what you want to believe. But why would you do study both? Why do you just get one? One science says elephants fly. Another science says no elephants don't fly. You choose to believe the one that elephants fly because you just have believed because you had a dream that an elephant was flying. 
So you believe the one that's in science that said elephants fly because of what you say you saw. You see what I'm saying? So, so you got to be real careful about it. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Amen. To show you when you sit down with the word, you can't sit down with the word your human intellect. The Bible says the carnal mind of man cannot understand the spiritual things of God. He said they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand like the itching ear syndrome. <laughs> yeah, and, and that really is what it is. You got, you got something you already got in your head that you're trying to find things to support it. But Louis says, he said, no one, can, no one can please God without faith. Whoever goes to God must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. All right? The, the, here's the reward that I found that God has given me when I seek him. The biggest reward I found was understanding who I was in him and understanding the breadth and depth and the height and length of his love for me and why he loved me. You know why God loves you and I so much and for those who place their faith in Jesus? Because we look just like him. See, but religion didn't let you know that, did it? Religion didn't let you know you look just like him. Religion convinced you, no, you're just a sinner saved by grace trying to work it out. And, oh, but just masses show up back here, masses. This, uh, oh, hear my whole, old little weak, broken down voice. This, uh, come by, massa, come by. That's what religion taught us. Yes, sir. When he when he shows you something that's really undeniable, you see it for the first time. I mean, you look, it's like you you reading a scripture and you just seen it for the first time. Isn't that how it is? I mean, man, it's just that, clear. Man, that and that's exactly how it is. I, I remember uh, Beverly was telling me when Beverly you know, gave her life to the Lord, and you was telling me how you were sitting in the swing out in the yard and you was looking at the clouds and you said it was like you were seeing them for the very first time. You remember that? Mm -hmm. You know what? I had the same experience. When I got born again, I went outside and looked up like, whoa. Wow. I mean, everything was like alive to me. It, like, it was like I was seeing it for the very first time. I had never seen it before. Why? Because I was just seeing it for the first time because I was a new creation. And I was seeing it for the very first time. And God, when you seek him, what he'll do is he'll begin to reveal himself to you. And the more you understand who he is, and you start getting to those places of identity, you'll, you'll start understanding, wait a minute, that's who I am too. Come on, what my daddy do, I do. And I don't have to be defeated. I am an overcomer, because my daddy's an overcomer. Amen. So when you, when you seek him, you're going to find him. You're going to you, you see the relevance of the word. It, it is like you'll sit down with it, and it'll, it will... It, I, I have sat down with the Bible sometimes, and just asking the Lord stuff, it was like I was reading it. It was like there were certain lines. It's like, it's like they, they went into a 3D mode and raised up off the page. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, mm -hmm. and I saw it for the first time. I'm like, wow. See, that's why when people tell me, well, I don't believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. Dude, you ain't, you ain't had no encounter with God. You're just encountering, encountering human intellect. Because there have been many times when I sat up and, and, and the words just raised off the page. And like, whoa. And I see it. And it's, not only do I see it, but I see the... The, the insight and revelation that comes by the Spirit. And it's not only does he give me that verse, but then he begins to speak about other voices that connect to that voice. And it's almost like I'm seeing this puzzle come together. And I'm like, wow, so that's how that ties it in. That's how that ties it in. And that's how that goes. Wow, I never saw that before. It blows your mind, don't it? It's like, man, wow. It just, wow, it does. It's good. It's like, man. You think I'm doing it? Because sometimes it takes you a minute for your brain to catch up with it. It's like, man, that's good. So, so you can't get that through human intellect. Because a carnal mind of man cannot understand the spiritual things of God. Look, what Louis says, this is verse 7. It says, Faith led Noah. 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 Okay, if faith led Noah, then what had to be leading Noah? Well, we know you just said faith. The Spirit had to believe. How did the Spirit come? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. So if faith led him, that means the word he heard from God was what led it. What was it? Faith led Noah, listen, faith led Noah to listen when God warned him about the things in the future that he could not see. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I ain't never seen it. You ain't never read it by faith. You don't see if you approach God with this, I don't believe who you are. Of course he ain't gonna reveal nothing to you. If you approach
supposed to go the attitude, eh, that's down. But then he go, you know when God goes shut that, they go, boop, shut it up. Because you're not approaching him with faith. He that comes to God, God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not just information. Not just, you know, just information about the Bible. No, that seek him. Lord, show me your face. Not just your stuff. See, I would equate this to the word of God. It is God's living word, but it's still kind of like stuff. But I need to see you because when I see you, it validates this. <laughs> if you ever had an account with God, guess what? When you go out and read this, you read this with a whole other set of eyes. It, you, it just changes everything. Oh my goodness, okay. Let, let me keep reading. It says, So faith led Noah to listen when God warned him about things, the things in the future that he could not see. He obeyed God and built a ship to save his family. Through faith, Noah condemned the world and received God's approval that comes through faith. So, so Abraham was considered righteous because he believed God. And the Bible says, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to, uh, uh, heirs according to the promise. The Bible tells us that Abraham is the father of our faith. Why? Because he's the first one that believed God. He believed it. When God spoke, he believed it. And God said, because you believe me, I counted as, I, I, I equated to your count as righteousness. So even before Christ came, God, Abraham had such favor in believing in God that God considered him righteous before the righteous one came and paid the debt for him, for him to be righteous. So that his faith didn't come by law. It came through obedience. His righteousness I mean, didn't come by, by law. It came through, it, it came through obedience. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And he our daddy. He's the father of our faith. Because it started with him believing God. Then look at verse 8. It says, faith, now this is Abraham. Faith led Abraham to obey God when God called him to go to a place. So faith caused him to listen. Faith caused him to obey. And if you don't obey what the word says, you're not listening to, fall, to God. To the Father. You're not listening to him. You can say, just because you know something don't mean you know it. Or just because you can quote something don't mean you know it. Just because you read it don't mean you understand it. And I hear probably a lot of people read and study and stuff, but they don't understand what they're reading and hearing. And, and listen, God never intended for you to say in the Old Testament. He's trying to bring you into the new. He's trying to bring you to Jesus. The, the law is complicated. The Old Testament, listen, the Old Testament without understanding of the New Testament, it, it, listen, will, will deceive you about who God is. And thus, there are things in the Old Testament you're dismissed because you don't understand the, the God in the New. You can't understand God without the Son. Because Jesus himself said, I have come to reveal the Father to you. With well, Jesus, they got the law. They, why do they need to know the Father? They got the law. They don't need, they got the law. Jesus, no, the law, the law was never designed to, to reveal God to you. The law was designed to keep you till I came. So that I could pay for your debt. And I could bring, and I could and I could become the door through which you have fellowship with the Father. But we try to make the law do what the law was never designed to do. The law was not designed to save you. So when a person spends all their study time in the Old Testament, they'll never get to saving knowledge. Because the saving knowledge is in Christ. The law was designed to bring you to Christ. The law was supposed to frustrate you. Because the law, the Bible says, the law came the, came the knowledge of sin. Paul said, I would have known that I shouldn't steal until the law pointed it out to me. So the law kept showing me how messed up I was. The law kept showing me how, how far from God's standards I was. And he kept, it kept showing me how I kept falling short of it. And I could never keep it. And it, and it brought me to a place, it should have brought me to a place when Jesus showed up and says, I will be the law for, I will fulfill the law for you so that the law will be completed in you when you receive me. Mm. Oh, that's good. Isn't that good? But folk, I know folks, they, they, they study the old tale, old tale, old tale, old tale. But what about, you better get into the new to find out about you. Because the law was designed to bring you to Jesus. Now, now, nothing wrong with studying the old. But you better understand the new. Because the whole intent of the law was not to save you, but to bring you to the Christ through whom you could find your salvation and the one who could fulfill the law for you so that there would never be a need for you to make any other sacrifice 
for the, for the covering of your sin. The Bible says it's so pleased to father the bruise of son. Why? Because when Jesus gave up, gave up his life, guess what? There was no need for any other sacrifice to ever be offered again. That means there's no sacrifice you and I need to make. Because Jesus paid it all. Go on. All to him I owe. Ooh. Seeing that level of chrism stand, but he washed me white this snow. Come on, amen. So, so people who live in the law and stuff, I didn't know I, I studied history, but in the New Testament, I studied Jesus. <laughs> Come on, amen. I mean, again, I'm not against studying the history, but you better get to know Jesus. Because if you don't get to know Jesus and you try to stay in the old without Jesus, the old will confuse you. Because the old will make God look like he's a psychopath. Or bipolar, because one means that God killing and God saving and God. No, no it's not that. Well, it's not confusing when you have the Holy Ghost. See, the, why? The carnal mind of man cannot understand the spiritual things of God. They are foolishness to him. So people, I have had people tell me, oh, that's foolishness. Why? Because they don't understand the new. They don't understand Christ. They don't understand the Spirit of God. They don't understand Jesus came to, gave, to give them the Spirit who would lead them into truth. So they omit the Spirit who leads them into truth and rely on their ability to study the old. And that's dangerous. Because it always creates arrogance when people think they know something. It just does. Okay, listen to this. Verse 8 says, Faith led Abraham to obey when God called him to go to a place that he would receive as an inheritance. Abraham left his own country without knowing where he was going. He didn't know where he was going, but, but, he, but he trusted the one who told him to leave. See? He trusted the one who told him to leave. So many times, listen, we, we fail to receive what God has for us because it, he tells us things that don't make sense to our carnal mind. And we trust our carnal mind more than we just have faith in him. Because if we truly believe that his word cannot fail, then whatever, whatever he tells us to do and wherever he tells us to go, that means he's already had the provision. Abraham would have never came, became wealthy as he was had he not obeyed God. But he had to trust that God knew where God was going when he didn't. And most Christians have a struggle. All of us have time when we struggle with that. To do what God says when it doesn't make sense. Because Have you ever had a situation where you're like, man, God's telling you, to do, you got this situation over here and you really want, you're asking God about this situation, you really want God to do something, and then when he does speak, he speaks about something that has nothing to do with that situation, or seemingly, and then you're like, well, God, don't you see this here? And, but you tell me to do that, but that ain't got nothing to do with it. God says it has everything to do with that. Hmm. Because when you get after my business, then I get after your business. See, you want to bypass my business for me to handle your business, but you don't want to be involved with my business. Now, get involved with my business, and I'll handle your business. Yes, sir. Joyce Myers got one of the best examples I've ever heard. She, uh, she was walking through a hallway, she said, and there was a ball of paper that she didn't throw down there, and he told her to pick it up. And she argued with him about it until she picked it up. And then she saw another one, and he, he kept telling her to pick it up. She said, what that led to me, what that led me to do was be fruitful for this big ministry. Mm -hmm. But at first, she had to obey him. I told him to pick up the paper. Exactly. And little things. And little things. And people won't do the little things. And little things. <laughs> but they want great things. But they won't do little things. Mm -hmm. That's what she's talking about. Yeah. Amen. I agree with her. I remember that story, too. Oh, okay. People don't realize it. Like she talking about pushing, she, she'd also talk about pushing the shopping carts back. Yeah. The Lord tell her, push, push the shopping carts back. Put the, put the, she said, but Lord, I need that shop. I need people. That, why I got put? Because I told you to do it. And she mm -hmm. said, he said, but all that was a setup mm -hmm. for her ministry. Mm -hmm. Like pushing the shopping cart back. Mm -hmm. Take it all Take it all the way back up there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to walk up. <laughs> you know, she said, I can't even find nobody to take a shopping cart. So I just, you know, so I had to obey God. Sometimes she said, sometimes I have to pick up extra shopping cart that I didn't even leave out there. Mm -hmm. But what, what is God doing with all that little stuff? He's preparing you for your future. <laughs> but if he can't get you to obey him on little things, he's showing me and trust you with no great thing. Amen. <laughs> Reverse 9 says, Faith led Abraham to live as a foreigner in the country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. So you notice his children got in on the promise because he obeyed. But look, notice how they lived in tents. Well, I don't want to live in no tent. I didn't do no I don't want to go through that. I just want God to bless me real good. Oh, so you can't live in a tent in the will of God. See, some people think that it's, everything has to be perfect, or it's not God. Dude, I'm telling you, if, if everything had to be perfect for me to do something, I, try, I would not be here tonight. <laughs> I would be doing something else. No, it don't have to be perfect to be in the will of God. Amen. People don't have to understand you. 
Don't mean you're not in the will of God. People say you're stupid for doing what you do. It doesn't matter as long as you know you're in the will of God. Because God didn't speak to them about your destiny. God spoke to you about your destiny. That's right. Amen. So, so it, don't make, it don't have to make sense to nobody else. They're not called to, I'll tell you, you're not called to do what I do. Of course you can't understand. You're not called to do it. Amen. So, so you know, I just say leave people alone, man. You know, if you know, if you obey in God, now this is just something simple. Yeah, we'll say something. But I mean, you know, you don't know what God's calling people to do. And, and you know, before you in, it, uh, 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 push your will onto somebody because you don't understand, you you need to step back and pray for a minute and pray for them. Then maybe God will give you some insight when you learn how to serve them through prayer. Then maybe God can give you some insight to speak into their lives. But if you just go go tell them they're wrong, they're gonna shut you down every time. Amen. Because you might just be speaking out of your will and your perception. Mm. All right. Verse 10 says, Abraham was waiting, was waiting for the city that God had designed and built, a city with permanent foundations. So know why he knows why he, he dwelt in tents. Mm. He was waiting for the city that God had designed and built. Now, did Abraham get to see that in his lifetime? No, he didn't get to see it in his lifetime. So he spent his life living in tents. But he knew, listen, but he understood he was birth for eternity. And guess what? He go see that city. <laughs> Look at verse 11. Faith enabled Abraham to become a father, even though he was old, and Sarah had never been able to have children. Abraham trusted that God would keep his promise, that God would keep his promise. That's what we have to do. We have to trust that God will keep his promise. See, this is enduring faith. This is the act of faith. The, 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 the real, the actions of, of enduring faith is we trust God, we believe God. We don't turn to the left or right. We don't give up. We don't throw in the towel because it gets hard. We don't give up because we know we live in tents when we have visions for mansions. Amen. Come on, amen. Come on, amen. We'll drive the hoop. Amen. Believe in God for something better. We, we'll have imperfect situations while we're waiting for the perfect revealing of God. You see what I'm saying? So, so don't let these things, uh, what you see, affect what you do as long as you've heard the Lord. Trust God. Amen? Keep your eyes fixed upon Him. And, 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 your, and your actions will always uh, convey enduring faith. Say, I'm not going to quit just because I'm dwelling in tents. <laughs> you may not... You might not Live in the ideal. Your account might not look the way you want it to look. But trust me, all that is temporary. Because when your temporary hits eternity, all that's going to be made up for. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it can't be better in this life. You know, it can be, you know. But, but that's between you and the Lord about to work that out. Because, because everybody's not the same and everybody's not called to the same thing. Sometimes what we want isn't what he wants for us right now. He didn't say he didn't want it for us, but some things are not for right now. And so sometimes we get impatient, don't we? And we want God to hurry up. Well, I've been saying that. Y'all think I ain't been saying that. I've been looking at my car and stuff and situations and hurry up. Can't you just like speed up a little bit? <laughs> you know, but I have to endure. I say, you know what? I'm still going to be faithful to you. I'm still going to do what I need to do. I'm still going to teach the word of God. I'm still going to raise my son. Praise God. Amen. I'm still going to do what I, what's necessary to make sure things function and work the way you want them to. Even when I don't understand, I, I can still, still go, fall back to the Lord. I trust you, though. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I don't like being single, but guess what? Oh, well. <laughs> it is what it is. I can't do nothing, well, I can't do nothing about it, but except trust God. Amen. I, I miss it, man. I, I mean, I miss, I miss being married. I love being married. But at the same time, I'm not going to do it just because I, de I, desire, I desire it. I'm going to wait on God. Amen. I'm going to set my feet in the will of God and do what the Lord told me to do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. We'll stop right there. And uh, I guess we, we, we will pick up a little bit next week maybe. I might have one more thing I might share with you about enduring faith. And then I think I should be able to finish it up now, next week. All right. Well, let's pray. Hallelujah. Father God, we do thank you for the word, Lord. And, and we thank you that... Uh, through your word, you'll show us the actions of enduring faith, that, that our faith really should look a certain way. It's a faith that is established on the, with that which you have revealed to us through your word, that, Father God, help us to not fall into the trappings of religion or even, uh, even law, 
but that, Father God, we will be led by the spirit of love in everything that we do. And that through our love for you, Father, that agape love, that we'll obey you in everything that you're calling us to do. And that we will be content in whatever state and situation we find our, ourselves in. And that in everything, Father, we will give you praise and glory, Father. Because you said in all things to give you thanks. Not for it, but in the midst of it. Because we know that, that you are still our God and you are our daddy. And that you love us and you have a wonderful plan and purpose for our life. And you have promised us a good life. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we praise you. And we just give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.